<laughs> Good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest in our Social Context of the Law series. It's very good to see those of you who are here in the uh, sparkling new lecture theatre. Uh, and of course, we also welcome those of you viewing the proceedings online. Today, our topic is terrorism, or to be more precise, the legislation that states have introduced to deal with terrorism in its various manifestations. And sharpening our focus uh, further, we're going to concentrate on two democratic states with much in common, including shared history and values, but with distinct cultures and constitutional arrangements, namely the United Kingdom and Australia. Both states have, of course, had to confront the problem of terrorism domestically and internationally, and both have turned to the independent bar to undertake the scrutiny of existing or proposed legislation in this field. However, again, their approaches have been different, such differences extending, as we'll hear, considerably beyond the language used to describe the two roles, reviewer in the UK, monitor uh, in Australia. This evening, we're very fortunate to have with us both a distinguished former occupant of the Australian position of independent national security legislation monitor, Professor James Rennick, and also the current independent reviewer of terrorism legislation in this country, Jonathan Hall. Now, in terms of the shape of the evening, I propose to say as little as possible, preferring rather to let them slug it out until about quarter to seven, at which point I know they will welcome questions from you. But before the debate begins in earnest, let me give them both the very briefest of introductions. James Rennick uh, is on record as wanting first to be a poet. However, he took his father's advice and turned to law. After working in government, he came to the bar in 1996 and developed a wide ranging practice in constitutional, administrative and commercial law. He became senior counsel in 2011 he has a doctorate in constitutional law from Sydney University and since 2012 has been adjunct professor at the Australian National University in Canberra. Now, he became Australia's third independent national security legislation monitor in 2017 and served till 2020, issuing a number of reports on a wide range of topics during his tenure. I should add that he is a longtime naval reservist and in 2019 was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. Jonathan Hall was called to the bar in 1994, took silk in 2014, and is a member of 6KBW College Hill. And like many able criminal practitioners, he's expanded his practice into the fields of public and specifically national security law. He was on the attorney's A panel before taking silk and is known for his work in proceeds of crime and other sensitive cases, both in the High Court and in inquests and inquiries. He was first appointed as the UK's independent reviewer in 2019 and was reappointed earlier this year. He's published reports, articles, and responses on a wide variety of issues, in addition to his annual reports. His most recent response, I think published last week, being to the public consultation on the vexed topic of non-jury trials in Northern Ireland. And so, uh, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan first. He's playing at home, as you know, and James has graciously agreed that he should kick off. Well, Rory, um, I'm bound to say I approach this topic with neuralgic sensitivity because, as James Rennick will no doubt quickly and very justly point out, perhaps by reference to the unlawful prorogation of Parliament under Boris Johnson or the quick 
turnover of recent governments that relying on convention and practice is rarely enough. And what he would be referring to, of course, is the difference between our roles and certainly a difference that is important to lawyers. When he was the reviewer, James not only had staff and premises, but he had a whole statute, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act 2010, which defined his job and gave him powers to carry it out. The position here is very different. A single section of the Terrorism Act 2006 requires the government to appoint a person who must deliver an annual report for mm. eventual submission to Parliament, and that's it. So the effectiveness of the reviewer in the UK depends upon past practice and convention and the relationship that each reviewer has with the government, the police, parliament, the public, the media, and so on. The truth is that if I ask for secret information relevant to my job, to see a document, and the government or the police refuse to let me see it, I could not invoke a statutory power to compel, compel them to do that. That is something that James could have done. I don't know whether he ever had to do it, but he certainly had that arrow in his quiver. By contrast, I could only invoke the role itself as it's become defined by reviewers of the statue, uh, statue of, of Lord Carlyle, who took the role on after 2000, Lord Anderson and Max Hill, now the DPP. And I could say to the government, has it come to this? And how do you think parliament or the media would respond if they found out that you were keeping things back from the terrorism reviewer? I haven't had any problems, but that would be what I would have to fall back on. I've mentioned the media twice now, and deliberately so. Having less formality, the UK reviewer has been free to develop his role, her role, in the future. The first terrorism attack that took place after my appointment in 2019, I remember requests for radio interviews coming in from Radio 4 Today programme, and David Anderson texting me to say, over to you. And it's become an outward-facing role very different from Australia. Again, when I was appointed, I picked up the 3,000 or so Twitter, Twitter followers that Max Hill had attracted since he took over from David. And like them both, I tweet about terrorism. That's how Rory, I suspect, knows about what I said last week about non-jury trials. Very different from Australia. In 2020, the government started to promote a series of counter-terrorism bills on terrorist defenders in prison and on release. And I was being asked for my views behind the scenes. But I thought, if I have got views on legislation going through Parliament, why not publish some of those views? So I've started the practice of publishing notes on counterterrorism legislation on my website, <coughs> advertised via Twitter. And these are very frequently picked up and cited in parliamentary debates. Again, very different, I think, from Australia. Indeed, there's no piece of counterterrorism legislation on the statute books or counterterrorism bill that's currently presented to Parliament where an MP or a peer or a parliamentary committee or a journalist or an NGO or a member of the public cannot in principle contact me and get a hopefully informed and certainly independent view. Of course, I'm not saying the UK system is perfect and it wouldn't be for everyone. Fundamentally, in the UK, it comes down to a simple duty to do an annual review of the terrorism acts. This brings a sort of completeness in having to compile a 200 page document every year on how terrorism laws operate. By contrast, I've noticed that the first Australian monitor, Brett Walker SC, he did lay down a comprehensive analysis of some of the more contentious Australian counterterrorism powers in his first annual report. And believe me, there were a lot. In 2019, researchers calculated that between 2002 and 2007 in Australia, a new counterterrorism law was passed every 6.7 weeks. But since then, the annual reports of the Australian Monitor have shrunk to about 20 to 30 pages, not including annexes, setting out more or less what the Monitor has done in that year. In fact, over the last few years, it seems to me, and James, happy to be corrected, that the real function of the Australian Monitor is to produce reviews that are focused on particular topics. And I think that observation is consistent with the analysis by the academic Jesse Blackburn, who's written extensively about our respective roles. So the glory of James's very distinguished three-year term was his review of the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistant and Access Act 2018. This was an act that underpinned their ability to do the more spooky end of telecommunications uh, spy work. It was an act that even when it was passed by the Australian Parliament was known to be unsatisfactory because of a lack of parliamentary scrutiny, 
and it was passed to James to review after its enactment by this powerful intelligence committee. In my view, it's a brilliant report, and I could also point out to James's fantastic review of sentencing of child terrorist defenders or of citizenship loss. But there was, on his watch, no review of the whole landscape of terrorism legislation. So I'll end my remarks by a general comment and a mischievous comment. The general comment is that the UK reviewer, my role, is able to speak publicly and independently about terrorism generally, to inform the debate generally, and to inform the debate specifically when bills are before Parliament, whereas the Australian monitor has more formal powers but a narrower output. The mischievous comment, and this is where I'll end, is that the Australian monitor role may even have an adverse effect on Australian counter-terrorism legislation, because the Australian Parliament knows that after it is enacted unthought through legislation, it could, in principle, ask the Australian monitor to pick up the pieces. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Master Treasurer, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be here tonight. I think the last Australian to speak in the social context of the law was the then Australian Chief Justice, Robert French. So it's a great honour for me to be here. Let me answer the question posed in the debate immediately. It is better to monitor than it is to review. It's good to review, but it's important to do both, not least because of the support each role gives to the other. So may I immediately acknowledge with thanks the remarkable quartet of reviewers, three of whom are here tonight, that you've had since 2001. Before coming to four key differences between the role, all of which where I think we might have the edge, can I just give you a couple of bits of context you may not be aware of. And one of them is that in Australia, it's almost a pastime to see a problem and pass a law. Um, since 9-11, we have passed over 130 counter-terrorism and national security laws. I read with wry amusement what Lord Justice Haddon Cave said in his Greys in Reading last year, that English law has become increasingly complex, unclear and inaccessible. And then I looked at the figures, 50 to 70 statutes a year, admittedly some quite long, enacted in Britain. And I thought, if only. In Australia, we last passed about 70 laws in 1955. In recent years, we generally present over 200, sometimes up to 250 bills, and enact more than 150. So that's one important difference, and it's relevant to the question of whether you comment on bills. Another key thing is that, and we perhaps may come to this in a minute, is that one substantive difference is that you, um, when you have a terrorist act which results in death, you, pu you punish it or you prosecute it as murder, whereas we prosecute it as terrorism. And I'll be happy to come back to that in a minute. Just on the threat of terrorism, I agree there's a risk of overstating it. But I think one thing we have in common is neither the reviewer nor monitor have ever been guilty of that. Whether you take radical Islamist terrorism or the strange collection of people who make up extreme right-wing terrorist groups, they are not an existential threat to either nation. Whereas, and we may come to this, um, espionage and foreign interference are increasing threats to our nations. In the material which I've circulated, um, I make the point that, of course, I'm not downplaying the horror of terrorism. One only needs to think of the Westminster Bridge attack in 2017, where the attacker, giving no prior notice, killed five people, including one Australian, injured 50, and the entirety of his attack with a motor vehicle and a knife um, from the time he began to the time he was uh, killed by the police took 82 seconds. Or put yourself in the position, if you will, of a police or security chief facing the horror of the triple Bataclan attacks. Come then to the strengths of the monitor role over that of the reviewer. And I um, call in aid here the view of the French philosopher who once said, yes, yes, I know it works in practice, but the question is, does it work in principle? Um, it seems to me there are four advantages the monitors have over the reviewers. The first and critically, and it's one answer I think to Jonathan's point about media involvement, 
is monitors have public hearings and reviewers don't. And so very simply, the format was you would announce an inquiry, you would invite submissions, and then critically, you would quiz the, once you'd seen the files, um, you would quiz the uh, agencies in a confidential session. So with the full picture and the classified documents. That informed me, but it also gave the agencies, the intelligence, police, and the equivalent of the Home Office, a chance to think about how they would answer the same questions in an unclassified setting, because that was the next step um, a week or two later. The other thing, for those of you here who are interested in persuasion and public policy, is the language of criticism. So when I did a public hearing, I would set out my tentative views and say, look, I'm inclined to think that the law does or doesn't pass muster by reference to the statutory tests of proportionality, necessity, and proper protection of human rights. And by using that not so confrontational language, although everyone knew what I meant, I felt that was more effective than more strident language I could have used. The second advantage is um, not commenting on bills. And so let me take up Jonathan's challenge here. Um, you can see by the number of bills that if I and my predecessors had spent our time commenting on bills, we would have got, got nothing else done. And that's just a function of how many are passed. The second point of practicality is the time between when a bill was introduced and when it became law has ever decreased over time. The Bali bombing in 2002, 88 Australians killed out of 200. It took six to nine months to pass through the legislative process. The Christchurch attacks um, in more recent years, an Australian terrorist um, attacking people in mosques, um, we passed a law within a week outlawing live streaming of terrorist attacks. And so as a practical matter, even if the monitor wanted to get involved uh, in commenting on bills, you'd simply be run over. There is a point of principle though too, Jonathan, I think about commenting on bills and there is the risk, no matter how qualified your remarks are, and I read your very good remarks on the National Security Bill, which I think has just gone to the House of Lords, um, there is the risk, isn't there, that um, what you say about the bill may come back to haunt you if you then come to have to later review the act in its operation. Maybe that's more a theoretical than practical problem. Two other points, the power to obtain relevant material. I do think this is important and it's not just a matter of convention. Now it is true, I didn't have, I only once had a problem with an agency head who I thought was getting a little bit over enthusiastic um, and suggesting he wouldn't give me what I was entitled to. And so I thought, oh well. Um, so I said to him, if what you're saying is you want the comfort of a subpoena, I'm happy to give you one. Is that what you would like? And he said, oh, we always comply with the law. And I said, of course. So it is actually useful to have those powers. And a good test, it seems to me, is what the Republic of Ireland are looking at at the minute. They're proposing to set up an examiner. I put in a submission saying I thought it was really important they had statutory powers. I think the current version of the bill suggests the intelligence agencies in the Republic of Ireland could refuse to give the examiner material. I think that's a fundamental flaw if that were to go forward. And it just seems to me that, and this is the point about convention, conventions sometimes do break down when you most need them. And the fourth point, fourth and final point, just my opening remarks is this. Under the Monitor Act, the government had an obligation to publish or to table in parliament the public report. I could also do a secret report, which I did on a couple of occasions, but the public report had to be tabled within 14 days. And that meant it was at my, um, you know, it was my timetable, my report was done, it was in the public debate, it got things moving. Here, as I understand the practice, the government tends to withhold the tabling of the report until it's also come up with its response. And it just seems to me there is a risk that that involves pulling the teeth 
out of the report. So it seems to me, and um, perhaps I can quote Lord Anderson against um, uh, Jonathan, that as David said, respected independent regulators continue to play a vital and distinguished role, but in an age where trust depends on verification rather than reputation, trust by proxy isn't enough. Hence the importance of clear law, fair procedures, rights compliance and transparency, exactly, I would say, and at least until that is done, it is better than to monitor than review. Well, I am <laughs> going to pick up each of those four points okay. um, very gratefully. So the first point where, James, I think you were trying to dislodge my argument that the reviewer has a more open and public facing role, at least in relation to the media, is that the monitor conducts public hearings. As I understand it though, these are public hearings only on the specific topic that you are reviewing. And I mean, it's worth thinking whether or not it's a good thing, but certainly here, there will be burning issues that the public will have after an attack. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the interviews I did was after the shooting in Plymouth, a man called Jake Davidson, who was associated with the incel movement. And the public didn't understand why the police had not declared this as a terrorist incident. I think here, having an informed person who understands legislation, who can comment on an event that happens, is a good thing. And I don't think that the public hearings that you talk about, even though there's a lot of strength in them, in any way compensate for that. As to commenting on bills, I, I was interested that you led with saying that you just don't have the time to do it because some of these bills pass amazingly quickly. But I would perhaps like to know from you whether or not this is an objection of principle as well. It seemed to me that this was an objection of principle because even if there were some bills you simply didn't have time to comment on, I assume there would be some bills the monitor could. As to powers, um, I think it's a point taken, but since neither of us have had to use any sort of hard persuasion, or in your case, I think only once did you have to refer to your powers, it doesn't seem to me that it's really necessary. And the fact that the Irish are now in a rather tedious debate about whether or not the national security um, organisations have got the right to refuse, to some extent illustrates why you don't want to go there if things work. And the, the final point, which I think is, a, is an interesting one, because I know that David Anderson, who's here, was troubled by it, which is the question of why aren't the reviewers' reports published more quickly? Mm. And when I first took the job, I remember every day almost thinking, well, I've delivered my report. <laughs> why on earth hasn't it been published? And I would get on the phone to the Home Office and I'd speak to my contacts and they'd say, well, it's a submission that's going up next week and we're trying to find a slot in the grid, which is something the government has for announcing things. But I've slightly modified my views on this. I think the word I would use is socialization. If a government has a report and then it has to respond very quickly to it, I think the instinct I've picked up now is that sometimes it will say no. Whereas if it has longer with a report and even the opportunity to discuss it a little bit behind the scenes, it may be more likely that it's accepted. Mm. Thank you. Well, let me uh, deal with those. Um, media engagement is an interesting question, and you're right, there's nothing stopping the monitor from engaging with the media a lot. I have to say, being, being very frank, that um, firstly I knew I could never match David Anderson's brilliance on Twitter, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't ever use it. <laughs> but the other thing was, um, when I became the third monitor, one of my big aims to, was, to, was to ensure there was a fourth monitor. And the reason I say that is that Brett Walker, one of the great lawyers in Australia, at the end of his three-year term, his thanks from the government of the day was to say, well, thanks for doing those reviews. We, we think we'll just stop it there. We don't need the monitor position to continue. And it was only because there was a statute which says there shall be a monitor, <laughs> which the Labor opposition said, we're never going to consent to the repeal of the Act. That's what led to the monitor role continuing. And to be perfectly candid, I was always, having not dealt with politicians very much, I was always quite nervous about engaging with them and equally having no media training. And so my approach was to do things I could control a bit more, which were 
hearings, uh, lectures, which I did a lot of, uh, to students as well as to think tanks and the like. So it wasn't that I was afraid of it. Um, I did one interview, uh, and that's where the quote about my father and poetry uh, came from. Um, I was nervous about um, interviews as well, and indeed just not having much experience with journalists. I think if I'd taken a second term, I would have had more confidence in dealing um, with journalists. Um, so I think there are some uh, good points you make there. Um, I, d I do think there is a point of principle on the bills about not commenting on, well, there is a risk about being seen to give the tick of approval to bills, uh, which may hamper you when you come to do the review about how the law operates in practice. And um, you may say it's only a theoretical risk, but I think it's, it has the potential to be uh, significant. But there is just, in all seriousness, the impossibility of actually doing that in the Australian system. Um, so that's one of the reasons um, I didn't do that. Um, the powers point, I, 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 I do press that, and I do think the Irish bill is a very good example. I think if you've got the intelligence agency saying, we can hold things back from you, that is fundamentally wrong, and the parliament should be saying no. So what the Insulum Act said was that I could ask for anything, I was required to get and maintain the highest security clearance, and that was fair enough. And um, there were strict handling conditions which bound me as well. And I was always extremely careful about those things, of course. But from the beginning, the agency head said, whatever you need, you can have. I mean, as those who've seen secret material will know, sometimes you choose not to know things. Um, I was very reluctant ever to know current operational material. Uh, it is too heavy a burden uh, to hold and the, the great risk that quite inadvertently you might say something. So although sometimes that was offered, I was very careful about what I asked for. Um, but I do think it is a substantive point that you want to have um, those statutory powers. Um, and as to the reviewers' reports and where they go and the fact you don't do a comprehensive review, I take your point. Um, at the same time as I was doing uh, my reviews, there was a comprehensive review of terrorism and national security laws undertaken by Dennis Richardson. At one stage, the Prime Minister had asked whether I would be interested in doing it, and I said I would only do it as the reviewer or as a Royal Commissioner whereas he wanted it done in a less formal way. And I said, well, that's going to be inconsistent with my independence, which I thought was terribly important. Um, but it was interesting that Mr Richardson, who is a distinguished um, bureaucrat, former head of uh, ASIO, like your MI5, wasn't a lawyer. And of course, you get a different sort of report if it's not done by lawyers. So those are a few questions. Um, uh, one of the uh, questions I have for you, I suppose, is I think you've been doing a lot of work on online challenges, and I'd be interested to know more about what you see as the key challenges there. People mm -hmm. and investigations. On the people, it's the fact that a certain cohort of individuals, often very young, many of whom are neurodivergent, so have got autism, get sucked up into counterterrorism investigations. Mm. And it does seem to be related to the internet. They can find capability, they can find ideology online in a way that in the past, if I was a, in a terrorist group in organized North, Northern Ireland, I have to go and meet a man <laughs> who'd give me a book, sit on the park bench, and this can now be done online. And in terms of investigations, I, I, I really think that we're lagging compared to, well, the powers of the police to deal with things like remotely hold, held data. On my phone, I've got phone that's local and I've got phone, I've got data online in Dropbox. Um, when David Anderson did his review and he was dealing with the agencies, mm. he, conf he looked at conferring on them safeguarded, strong, but transparent powers about how you get this data and how you deal with it. If I went through a port, um, and there's this very strong power called Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act, and a police officer said, I don't suspect you of terrorism, but I'd like to have your phone, please. 
complete power to do that. And in practice, they will suck the entire contents of my phone. And if I said to them, what's going to happen to that data? Mm. I'm happy for you to have it, but how long is it going to be kept? They couldn't give a coherent answer. Mm. And that's all related to the volume of data that we have from the internet. So I think that we're lagging in terms of our laws, written in 2000, 2006, obviously well before the massive digital age. Those are my, those are my things. Yes, it, it's interesting just on that, and I mean, I, I gained enormous comfort from a question of trust which uh, David Anderson wrote, and indeed so much so that I also recommended that we have a body like IPCO, uh, and I know Sir Adrian Fulford had hoped to be here tonight, but it's a remarkable um, way of leveraging the value of the judiciary in this country uh, with technical advice. And so just for the audience, the problem in Australia is the most intrusive warrants take a computer access warrant, which is what it sounds like. Uh, you, by means unspoken, you get into someone's computer and have access to it. Um, that is something put up by the intelligence agencies or the police but it's approved by a judge or a tribunal member acting in their personal capacity, persona designata, that's for constitutional reasons in Australia, but they build up no um, general knowledge about the activities of the agency and they have no access to the technical advisory panel. And I had Sir Adrian and one of the TAP talking to some students of mine in London last Friday and it is a, can I just say, a fantastic system, and I'm still hopeful that we'll do it uh, in Australia, because what that allows you to do is to say, well, you're tracking target X. One way of tracking them would be to take out the whole city block where they are. You could do that. But there's another technical way, which the TAP might come up with, where you just concentrate on the person and their immediate um, surroundings. So. Um, I, I, I think, I know we should be disagreeing more, but I, but, but I think that is a, um, th th that's an excellent model and it's one I hope uh, will come to pass. One of the most persuasive things I thought in a question of trust was the revelation to me that the Home Secretary, I think Theresa May at the time, was issuing 3,000 warrants a year. Um, it's simply inhuman for anyone to be doing that and running a great department of state and appearing in parliament and doing constituency work. And the truth is a mistake will be made or if you have someone unlike her who was not conscientious, um, you will just, uh, you, you, you won't get adequate attention to detail. And that's something where I think both the monitor and reviewer role can add value. And one of the strengths we both have is we can be asked to do things out of the normal counter-terrorism straitjacket. Um, and um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in here is your national security bill, which is now building on some Australian law about espionage, foreign interference and so on, which I think you've said something about. Well, it's interesting <laughs> that, that we, 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 are, we are in the habit now of taking some Australian legislation. The last <laughs> Australian legislation we took was something called the Designated Area Yes. Offense, um, which was a brilliant Australian legislation. Uh, which, we've, which we have now on the statute books, and it allows Secretary of State to say, as of a part of the world, yes. you shall not go there. And if you go there without reasonable excuse, you commit an offence. Having got this wonderful legislation on the statute books, we've found it impossible to use as a country. It has never been used. Really? No area has ever been designated. Um, uh, the next thing that we've taken on from the Australians is... I think, the Sorry, can I just interrupt there? Just what we did is we designated the areas of Mosul and Raqqa. Yes. And the reason we did that was that they were truly lawless areas run by ISIL and the view was taken you could have no good reason to be there except for a limited yeah. number no, of reasonable you, you, excuses. You got there before us. I mean, but sorry, I think our I interrupted. legislation was only 2019, yeah. so well after the day. Yeah. Um, I mean, James, can I ask you a question? Yeah, which sure. I, I don't know, thinking about your, your point, which is a really good one and I concede, is, is one of the functions of this sort of role that we have. Mm is to hand it on to the next person. That's right. If, if you are responsible for that role, losing its public confidence and trust, um, that would be a disaster. It would. Um, and that definitely informs my, I think I started by saying, I feel neurologic about this. Mm. I'm conscious I don't have powers. I'm conscious it depends upon convention. And I feel nervous about it for that reason. Of course, I'm nervous about media engagement. And I was going to ask you about political engagement. Mm. 
Would the monitor be asked their informal views on legislation? So when government in Australia was formulating legislation, would they turn to you and say, what do you think about this informally? They didn't. Um, whether they could have, and if they had, whether I would have answered, I don't know. I, I, I suspect my cautious approach would be to say, well, that's very interesting. Um, if you want to know my institutional views, have a look at my previous reports. Um, but I'm not prepared to commit myself in advance to how the law works. I mean, it raises an interesting question, doesn't it, Jonathan, about to what extent, uh, when you are dealing with what might be seen as emergency powers, you're better off having them on the statute book or ready to put on the statute book, or whether you want to actually pass laws in an emergency. And we've, we saw examples of that, I suppose, in America after 9-11, where things were passed in a hurry, um, which I think members of Congress came to regret. And my approach was that it was generally better to have a well thought out law on the statute book in place. Perhaps it might only be brought into operation if a proclamation or something like that were made rather than do it on the run. Because the great irony is that although the media tend to criticise governments, when a disaster happens, they will criticise them more for not acting, not overacting, yeah. reacting, I'm sorry. I, mean, I think that's a really good point. We have legislation on the statute books here, which is in the draw. Yeah. So there's, at the moment, if you get arrested under the Terrorism Act, you can be held for up to 14 days pre-charge. There is legislation in the draw which, if it's brought into effect, and I can't remember what the mechanism is, David will know, would allow someone to be detained for up to 28 days. So that's an example of that. But I suppose that was debated against the background of already having had 28 days. Yes, yeah. And a great deal of experience of the sorts of length of detention that the authorities thought was needed when they were doing difficult investigations. I think the risk about having too much sort of on, in the draw legislation is that it may be thought about in the abstract. Mm -hmm. And the risk for me is that how would Parliament really debate and understand what it's doing if it didn't have concrete examples before it? And generally legislation is, I think, best when it's brought for a particular need rather than for a theoretical need. We were talking about mm -hmm. COVID <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and all of that. Um, I mean, here was legislation that was on the statute books, which, if you like, was there and available and then was used in this very, very broad way. Interestingly, it didn't have any sort of reviewer and very little parliamentary challenge. So I suppose that's why I'm cautious about having too much of that mm. on the stocks. Yeah. You were asking me about dealing with politicians. So as I say, that is not something, although I had met a number of attorneys general, it was usually at the state level, it was usually because I was doing a particular case. That was my dealing with politicians previously. And then all of a sudden you're meeting them all and I insisted on meeting all the relevant people and the shadows uh, as well, of course. One of the strengths, I think, in the Australian system is the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which we have. And I think, um, although I have great respect for individual members of your Intelligence Committee, I think one of the strengths of the Australian system is that it's not a backbench committee, as you would describe it. In other words, the opposition have their front benches on it. The shadow attorney, the shadow foreign minister are on that committee. Um, and you have the up and comers on the government side who also provide the chair. And the advantage of that, it seems to me, is that the opposition, as was the case this year when we had a change of government, um, those senior shadow ministers are then better prepared for the seamless transition of government on which our democracy depends. And I thought that was a, uh, that was a very strong uh, thing. There is a perennial debate, I think, in both of our countries about whether such committees should be able to deal with operational matters. My strong view is that that's a trap and they should stay clear of it. When you look at the American system where um, some of the committees do have operational material, the great example was, I think, in 2002 or 2003, there's this funny system there where the top, the, the, the ranking, the chair and the ranking member, so one from each side, are briefed in on the really secret stuff and the rest of the committee isn't. Well, firstly, that's something we resist. You tell the whole committee or you tell none of them. 
But that was the case where Nancy Pelosi, among others, were told about torture, the Abu Ghraib situation, but under conditions of secrecy. And that inhibited her ability to criticise. And that's, I, I think that is a reason why um, you either tell people properly or you don't, but operational material is simply too sensitive to be shared, uh, it seems to me, with any sort of committee like that. But I do think they should be properly resourced and I do think they have a very valuable role to play. Um, my interaction with them was that I would go, go and see them in private. I, I said, look, the risk about me giving evidence in public is that I'll be seen as a lightning rod for criticism. And I said, what I really want to do is talk to you about my processes, my reports speak for themselves. My last report was jointly to them as well as to the government. And that seemed to me to be um, a good process. Um, dealing with ministers depended very much on who they were. So Attorney General Brandis, who later became High Commissioner here, he liked me to pop in. And what I would do before Senate estimates, which is not something you should uh, regret not having. Yeah, so Senate estimates. Um, the upper house in Australia has twice a year a week of examination of bureaucrats about how they spend money. But it's actually not about how they spend money. It's all about policies and all the rest. And that was something um, I had to do twice a year. And I must say that, um, you know, uh, I'm not a late night person and they go from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. And I was sitting there at court to 11 one night with the late Margaret Stone, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, and texted my children saying, I'm still up. And they said, you should be in bed. You're no good this time of day. And I said, but this is democracy, you know. Um, but um, so with George Brandis, I would go and see him before I appeared before Senate estimates when I'd make an opening statement about what I'd been up to. Um, and really to ensure that my budget, my tiny budget, which was slightly larger than Jonathan's, but tiny, wasn't decreased. And I would say, look, this is what I'm proposing to say, Mr. Attorney, just tell me if it's factually wrong. So I wasn't going to change it, but unless there was some factual error. Whereas his successor was always very busy, and so I didn't bother him. So it, it depends very much on the personalities. I don't know, what, what is your dealings with ministers and so on? Well, I spend, I spend um, time with the security minister. So I have always met the security minister, who's the number two. Mm -hmm. So the minister within the Home Office, right. below the Home Secretary, who tends to have the brief for national security matters. Yes. Um, I also see opposition, um, sometimes at my request, mm -hmm. and I think it's worth introducing a topic into the political debate, um, and if they're interested, sometimes I've been asked to see them as well. Mm -hmm. So, like you, it's ad hoc. I mean, I was just going to finish off by talking about the, our Intelligence Services Committee. Mm -hmm. I think that its role hasn't yet fully crystallised, mm -hmm. Part of the problem, which is a, in a way it's a trivial problem, but I think it is relevant. If anyone's ever read a report of the Intelligence Services Committee, Security Committee, it has redactions in it. It does. And I can see the, the logic of, of showing the public that here was a passage, but things have been taken out of it. But it's incredibly hard to read. Yeah. And it gives you the sense, a very strong sense, that you aren't really getting the full product. Mm. So in terms of accountability and transparency and the dialogue with the public on whom all of this rests, it's their consent that matters, I don't think it completely does the job. I do feel that it's evolving. It has a formal relationship with MI5 mm. and the agencies. I would be interested, and I don't know, what they feel they get out of it as well. Do they feel that it increases the trust the public have of them for the public to see these reports or not? So I think that it's something who, which is still evolving. I think the relationship between all of our different, in fact, me, ISC, IPCO, I think the roles are still slightly finding their way after 20 years. <laughs> yeah, and my, uh, I agree with that. And my final point would be, I think the agency should see it as a great opportunity to simply educate mm. um, members of parliament and members of the House of Lords. It's, it's actually an important part of the function. Uh, Jonathan, to what extent do you think um, the Australian system has an advantage in having, as uh, James pointed out, you know, senior front bench opposition figures on, on the committee and rising stars of the, of the government party. Does that make a difference? Yes, I mean, James was saying before we were discussing, 
it's a good opportunity for people who are going to be exercising very strong powers to be mm. educated. Yeah. That's a good thing in itself. And also, I think it's good for frontline politicians who are actually going to have to make these concrete decisions mm. to be engaged. It's one thing for a backbencher to be, and there can be very excellent backbench supervision, mm. but actually it's people who will one day either be signing a warrant or not. That's right. And it's good to have them involved as well. Mm. And just one footnote about opposition involvement. The Inslam Act actually says that there must be consultation with the leader of the opposition before the monitor's appointed, and that's in the statute. Now, it doesn't mean consent, but it does mean consultation. And no doubt if there were a very serious complaint, perhaps the appointment wouldn't be made. And again, I think maybe that, is that a convention here? Would the opposition leader have been consulted? On your appointment, do you think? I, I, I strongly doubt it. Yes, I strongly doubt it. I think it would it would it would be a. I mean, David will know. <laughs> it was Corbyn at the time. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no. Yes, but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? I, I think that's a strength, and we have that in our intelligence. Services Act for the heads of ASIO, the head of the, the Foreign Intelligence Service. There's got to be a formal consultation with the leader of the opposition, and I think that's again that's a useful thing to have in the statute. Good. Well, I think we've uh, covered quite a lot of points on both sides, if I can put it that way, and so now it's a chance for uh, questions. Um, I think there have probably been some questions submitted online, and here comes the magic iPad. But perhaps we could start, while we're having a look at the questions here, with anybody in the room. So does anybody have a question for one or other or both of our speakers? Yes. Um, well, thank you for an excellent talk. It's been really interesting, very informative, first of all. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not the difference between speaking to the media and security clearance, whether they could coexist. So if you have very high clearance, obviously there's a higher risk when you're speaking to a media, to the media of saying something that could be um, an issue. Do you think that's why there is that distinct difference? Well, I can, I can answer that because I mean, I, I do have very high mm. security clearance yeah. to do the job, yeah. um, which is why speaking to the media is always slightly nerve wracking. Mm. Um, before I did this job, I did a lot of unusual litigation um, where I was acting for the government at the time. I no, no longer do that. In both open hearings yeah. and also in secret hearings. And I think that people who did the sort of role I did developed a sort of, if you like, a facility to compartmentalize mm. so that you could both know very secret stuff but be able to speak in court at which the alleged terrorist was present. Um, so it's it's not impossible, but it is a bit nerve-wracking, I agree. But it's the same in Australia. I had to get and maintain the highest clearance, and um, that didn't preclude me from talking to journalists. And indeed, as I mentioned, I had at least one formal interview. But I must say, when the... Um, so I'll tell you a funny story. So the Financial Review, a bit like your FT, have the lunch with, and so it was lunch with for me, and you get to choose the restaurant. So I chose the restaurant. And when we arrived there, the journalist said, oh, terrific, it's Friday, I think we'll have a bottle of something. And I said, no, I deliberately chose this restaurant, which is at a hospital, which doesn't have a license. <laughs> you think I'm going to talk about national security when I've had a few drinks? <laughs> you are joking. <laughs> Good. Can I be a slight spoil sport? Um, but first, can I express my admiration for James and for Jonathan and for David and for Max Hill as independent reviewers? I'm kind of their grandfather because I was the independent reviewer from 2001 to 2011, and the whole architecture of national security has become much, much more complicated because of huge developments in the online world in particular. But my spoil sporting goes like this. I don't think one's better than the other. I think our systems are rather different. And I think our systems reflect the relationship between our government and our parliament, and between our parliament and our media. Uh, incidentally, I feel I should just put this in as a matter of record. I did actually hold four public hearings, I think in 2005, 
the government not only didn't discourage them, but they encouraged me to hold them. And one of them was about Irish terrorism, and it was held in Belfast, and it was an interesting experience, and it was very productive. But, you know, I think that differing relationship, I, I don't know how many people like me have spent a day or two sitting in the, Australia, in the Australian Parliament, but it makes ours look sometimes like a Sunday afternoon vicarage tea party, frankly. And um, it moves at a faster pace, and it has a very different second chamber, as James has outlined. And I think our system probably works through its informality. It enables the independent reviewer to talk to the leader of the opposition or the opposition home affairs spokesman, if that seems like a sensible thing to do, but not to do it if it's just going to waste a day. I think it also helps that our independent reviewer is not full time. It sometimes feels like full time, but all of us have done other work whilst we've been independent reviewers. I once turned down the opportunity to full go full time on the grounds that it would uh, compromise my independence. And so I think I've followed the Australian system very closely. I think it serves Australia extremely well just as our system serves the United Kingdom very well. And I would not like to see our independent reviewer being given the power to obtain injunctions against people and so on, because actually the power to name and shame, I'll give you one small example, is very formidable. On one occasion, I said to one of the services, so you don't want me to see some of this material, so I'm going to write an open letter to the Home Secretary saying you refuse to let me see certain material, wouldn't matter what it was. And within about four hours, I saw all the material, including, as I put it to them, the post-it notes. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, on the question of full-time and part-time, it's interesting. Um, last Parliament in Australia, they amended the Insulum Act to permit the next monitor to be full-time and I gather that's under contemplation. I have made a similar point to yours. Um, I, I think Jonathan nominally does four days a week. Yep. I nominally, very nominally, do two days a week. Uh, it was full time quite often. I do think though you'll get someone different. Uh, you won't get a practicing barrister if you're told, well, you've got to leave the bar and do say three years. Um, and if you get a retired judge, um, it may be different here, but I've made the point that there are retired judges and retired judges. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one wants to get the right one. So um, th that I think would change it if it was full time. I think one of the strengths is I can still appear, or I could still appear in court as I did and do other matters and so on. And I thought that was very important. And it just kept me also with one foot in that camp. I completely agree about being part time. I just think yeah. that having being humiliated in front of judges or making submissions which fail, being tested is just terrific. Um, I mean, I'm in court tomorrow and I think I will almost certainly be humiliated in the King's Bench Division given the case I've got. But it's a good discipline. I really, really like it. I, I try and do, as, I try, it's four days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it feels like four and a half or five, but I do keep a practice alive. Um, yeah, so that, I, I completely agree, Alex. I would not want to see some official take on this role. You're also right about the written and unwritten. I mean, one of my uh, funny uh, engagements, I mean, the two people I always went to see right at the beginning of my uh, visits here were firstly you, and the other was Sir Brian Levison. And I would show you the list of people I was seeing, and you'd say, definitely not. Oh, yes, tick. And what about so-and-so? And so Sir Brian said, well, why isn't the presiding terrorism judge mentioned? And I said, I didn't know there was such a person. Is it written down? Oh, no. We all know who he is, though. <laughs> and so, you know, that, that, the unwritten part of the British Constitution is no doubt one of its glories, but it can be a bit um, opaque for outsiders like me. Can I pick up a question uh, which has come in from the online audience? And uh, Jonathan, it's really building on something you've just been talking about the importance, you both agreed, on being part-time only. Mm -hmm. But what actually does that mean for your practice? I'll answer that question. Total destruction. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, I've had to uh, not sign something, but I've had to give up my entire 
national security practice, I can't do my job and appear for no. or against the government. No, I agree. I've had to give up my public law practice in the sense that I can't appear for or against the government, and I've had to reinvent my practice to do more cases of crime and extradition. Um, so it's, it's had a very big effect, and the irony is that the reason I was fully qualified to do this job is I did a lot of national security litigation. I'm happy to tell you any of those cases if you want to. Um, but having qualified, I then had to stop doing it. And that is very much my experience as well. I mean, I was fortunate in that I did a number of long other inquiries. So I was involved in a very long war crimes inquiry um, and various other long matters. So I, I managed to balance things in that way. But yes, you don't do these jobs to make money. I think that's what we're both trying to say. <laughs> right, another question from the hall. Thank you. Um, I'm just inter interested to see and to, well, to hear about what uh, you consider to be the role and sort of the effectiveness of the monitor or the reviewing position when compared to the other forms of accountability in our systems, like public inquiries, coroner's inquests, but, uh, parliamentary committees like the ISC, and um, and I think Royal Commissions in Australia. And just sort of, they've all got their roles to play, but I'm interested to see how you see how you compare your roles with, with those institutions? Okay, um, yeah, I think that picking up something that Alex Carlon mentioned, the informality of the re reviewer role means that you actually can get to places that the more formal constructs we're talking about, inquiries, inquests, judicial processes, can't get to. An example of that is that I was very interested in this thing in Northern Ireland, which I'm not going to tell you very much about. And I knew it existed because I'd picked it up. But it wasn't until I was being driven around by a police driver in Belfast that he finally revealed its existence to me. And two years later, I found out precisely what it was. Now, I don't, I don't think that I could do a lot of what I do and understand the way that terrorism works if I was a judicial body, if I was literally calling witnesses and waiting for whatever evidence was put in front of me. As an informal person, an independent person, I can just follow my nose. And if there's something I don't quite the, the, the smell of or the sound of, I can keep going, keep going, keep going. So I think that's, that's a, 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 a really profound difference. It's the ability to get down amongst the people who are actually doing it, with the, with the police officers, but also interrogate ministers, etc. To which I would add, and I think this is the same with Jonathan, you've got two things the monitor can do in principle. One is the own motion inquiries, where I could just, there's a long list of things I could look at at any time of my own motion. Um, and it was up to me what order I looked at things, unless the Prime Minister said, you shall do this first. He could sort of play a trump card. Um, in addition, other things could be given to me by either the Prime Minister or the Attorney General, and the encryption uh, report was an example of that. And so, um, but other than that, I agree with what Jonathan said. I just think it's a, it's a real strength that you've got, in my case, a sort of standing Royal Commission with the capacity to say, I'm going to look at this now, I'm going to look at that now. Well, there's a question arising out of that, though, Jonathan. Do you think the public, you've referred to on a number of occasions, do you think that way you conduct your role is understood enough, appreciated enough? Um, no. I think the public just see me as they probably think I'm a member of the government. I mean, whenever my role is referred to publicly, I'm always the government's independent review yeah. of terrorism legislation. I, I, I doubt they do at all. I mean, something I've I've tried to explain, but I don't know how much it's cut through, is that when I did my report on terrorism in prisons, um, the government expressly didn't want me to do it. Um, I said, would you like me to do it? They said no. Um, but I said, I want to do it anyway. Um, but by the time the report comes out, and in fact it's been largely, almost entirely accepted by the government, it just appears to be another official report. So I don't think the public do. All I will say is the nicest thing anyone said about me is that when I did my encryption review and we had a couple of days of public hearings, there was a live stream and there was a live blog. And there was some distinguished blogger called Znet or something. And after a day and a half, I was gratified when he said, this bloke, i.e. me, he's really trying quite hard. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, another question from the hall. Yes. See, my question's um, centered around the rising stars um, that you mentioned in the Australia process. Um, my question is centered around the rising stars that you mentioned. And um, given the digital nature and the online nature of things, how are you ensuring that those rising stars are adequately informed around what cyber means, putting aside their own um, nuances around it? And I'm looking at it as, an, as a generational question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, um, so talking then about members of parliament, so in an informal way, what I've tried to do is when I know someone's a new MP and I know them because I've acted for them, I know them in some other way, I write them a note saying, you know, congratulations. Apart from being an expert in what you are in now, why don't you think of making national security the other string to your bow? It's fundamental. You're going to be there for quite a long time, you hope, in Parliament. And too few people, and of course our Parliament's much smaller than yours. You know, we've got 72 in the upper house and 146 in the lower house. So it's a smaller group. Um, that is one thing, I think, just encouraging people to be interested. Um, the university where I teach part-time has just um, been asked to provide information briefings for new parliamentarians, and I've perhaps unwisely volunteered to do some of those. So I'm going to talk to them much about what we've talked about tonight. Um, the technology question more generally, it moves so fast. And one of the real skills, I think, is being able to just explain what effects you're talking about. Um, because after all, legislators have to know that the laws they're coming up with are technology neutral. They're still going to work, uh, even if there's some new whiz-bang gadget. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think that um, so little is understood about technology mm. by our lawmakers. Yeah. Um, people talk such nonsense about what should and should not be done yeah. without knowing the consequences. Sure. And you know, the example is, that I would give the countless examples, it's about the internet, that you've got your social media platforms who have the content, mm. but then beneath that you've got the internet architecture. Mm. Some people would advocate that those companies that control the internet, the, the domain name server, etc., should themselves be subject to direction by the government. It makes a lot of sense until you think that we wouldn't want the Chinese government to be responsible for the architecture of the, government, uh, of the internet. And I think that is one of the most difficult things, is given that technology and terrorism is so important, and we do need to update our laws, how do you make sure the people who make the laws and are legitimate lawmakers understand the consequence of what they do? And, and I don't have an easy answer. Right, we have another question uh, from the online audience, and, and I'm going to put it to Jonathan. Do you believe that there needs to be more work done on the use of Section 43 and the interactions between police and members of the public filming and photographing outside public buildings? Um, this, the, I, I know from your question you're referring to what's called auditors, um, and I was emailed um, by an auditor uh, um, earlier this year to say, Have, are you aware that, that we, my community of auditors, and it's a sort of American movement, people what does who, it mean? It means taking a camera, going around the back of a police station, and taking photos and film of the registration plates of police officers, all hanging outside the MI6 building. It's, oh, right. it's a, we need to show you, the public, what's going on in the secret state. And what happens is that a police officer comes out and says, what on earth are you doing? And the guy says, well, I'm just filming, I'm auditing. And they say, right. And they look at the available powers they've got. What can they do? And they seize, typically, on one of the sections of the Terrorism Act, Section 43, and they say, well, I'm going to stop and search you on the basis I suspect you're a terrorist. And the result, I'm afraid, has been um, a lot of damages have been paid from, by the police because when, it turn, when, they, when they challenge, uh, of course they didn't suspect they were terrorists. They were just rather annoying men with video cameras. Um, and 
what I discovered is that in Scotland, they've got some wonderful Police Scotland guidance for how to deal with this phenomenon. And they don't have this problem because the guidance is crystal clear. It tells police officers what to do in the situation. So, I mean, in my report that hasn't yet been published, I'm recommending that the police in England and Wales should adopt that guidance. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's very funny, uh, but, it, but it, it happens. And I, I have all the sympathy in the world with the, with the police, um, but equally I have some sympathy with the auditors. It's an interesting question. In the 1970s, so in Australia, it is a crime to uh, mention the name of an officer of the security services or the foreign security services except for the Director General. And that was the law in the 1970s as well. And there was one um, member of a state parliament who late at night would read out the names and addresses in parliament of these people. And was very. And if the presiding officer wasn't with it, he didn't stop it. And that caused enormous problems. You know, whole families had to be moved at short notice and so on. So that's another twist. Now, are there any more questions in the room? Not that I can see. Well, there is another one um, uh, from an online uh, viewer, and it's addressed to both of you. And I quote, I'm interested in understanding the process of when a terror act occurs and what then happens in the timeline between the offence and a new law rule being brought in. If you remember, you talked, um, James, about the yeah. massively decreasing yeah. period. So what happens in the six days after um, the, the, the more recent incident you mentioned? Yes, yeah, so in the, the, the Australian model really is um, almost all of our laws are a direct reaction to a terrorist attack. Bali, London 7-7, um, Madrid, and I think the, both the bureaucrats and the politicians got into the habit of saying, well, we don't want anyone to ever say that we didn't have a law which could be used in these circumstances. So to take that example, I think people were shocked in Christchurch to see that this fellow was live streaming from a, had a helmet cam of murdering people in mosques in Christchurch. And so that was a relatively simple thing. Now, to answer your question, was it something that had been in the bottom drawer and the bureaucrats thought, terrific, we now have an excuse to get it out? That I don't know. Uh, but in principle, I think it's a mistake to pass things too quickly. Let me give you a real example of when it might be a good idea to pass a law quickly. So I first became involved in terrorism cases in 2005 or six, and what had happened was that there were two groups um, who were um, thinking about a major terrorist attack at a sporting event or something like that. And it was quite interesting and different to how you do it now. So the police found out about it and they went through the front door and they had highly publicised raids, people were questioned, and the idea was to frighten off these people. And many were frightened off, no problem. Whereas now, of course, you might get no warning, they might act. But some continued. And so you can assume we got to a point where all the authorities were listening and observing what these people were up to. But they knew, we knew they were going to do something. What we didn't know was the ultimate target. And the problem was the law at the time um, said that to charge them with something which fitted the criminality, you'd have to know the target. And so the Attorney General went to the Prime Minister and said, it needs, we need to change the terrorist act the word the to a terrorist act. And John Howard recalled Parliament on 24 hours, the first time it had ever been done, passed the law changing the to a, and the arrest took place the next day. And that's a real example, I think, of where it's simple, justified, you could do it. Um, it is rare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had the, David will know the answer, but we had the emergency legislation to delay the release of terrorist offenders. There was a run of attacks by both serving prisoners and released terrorist offenders. And I think that was brought through in a matter of was that a week? Something like that. But it was it, it was quick, not as quick as 24 hours. Right. I mean, I think that either you, 
generally terrorism legislation is and I think ought to be a reaction to concrete events. Sometimes there's a temptation for governments to have little pet projects. So there are quite influential think tanks that exist in the UK. Quite often they will have pet projects and legislation. And there's a temptation perhaps to reach for those. Yes. Um, I think also in terms of the f ebb and flow of terrorism legislation, after 9-11, um, there were some quite strict measures, including depriving um, people of, of their liberty who couldn't be deported, the famous Bell March case. Um, then there were these control orders, which Paul Carlyle um, uh, advocated for. And then there was a slightly, as it turned out, misguided liberalizing where some of the powers, in, including importantly the power to say to dangerous terrorism suspects, you've got to live elsewhere, quite important to move them away from their networks. Mm -hmm. That power was removed. And then thanks to, 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 to David uh, Anderson, that power was restored. So I think what we've seen is we've seen a bit of an ebb and a flow. And I think that what would happen, and what I'm, I'm most sort of worried about, if you had a series of attacks, what would the government do? I think they would reach back to over the last 20 years and look at some of the tougher measures which have now gone and say, well, let's have them. That could be much lengthier periods of detention. So at the moment, 14 days for a suspect, that could increase 28 days. I think also if there were a series of attacks by known suspects and there were fears of attacks by further suspects, I think they probably would, people would be thinking about deprivation. Um, I know in Australia you've got tougher laws there, you can deprive people who have even served their criminal sentences. I think the government would look at those sorts of things. Mm. Yeah, so one of the big issues in Australia at the minute is the return of the so-called ISIL brides and children, some of them very young, some not so young. And that is, that is really going to test the efficacy of a number of these laws, I think, because one of the reasons we had declared areas is you can't actually prove what's gone on in a lawless zone overseas. So I'm just interested to observe that. But we already have real examples of um, members of the Yazidi community who, of course, ISIL sought to wipe out in a quite shocking way, saying, you know, I'm walking down the street and I saw so-and-so, and they were the perpetrators of some terrible things in Mosul or Raqqa. And that's a real question just of the you know, coherence of society and what law can do about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I've been trying to slightly push informally behind the scenes mm. is, is the offence of pillage, mm. um, which is a war crime, uh, which they, they actually prosecuted very successfully in Germany. So if the evidence that you had was that someone had taken a picture of themselves mm. on their phone, Mm -hmm. in their new house in Raqqa, mm -hmm. and that was the house of a Yazidi family, and you could prove by inference or directly that they had driven that person out of mm -hmm. their home. Mm -hmm. That is, in principle, prosecutable as a war crime of universal jurisdiction, and it has been done in Germany. And I am, I am interested. I do think we are... I would like more to be done so that in the event that people have to return... Mm -hmm. Um, at the very least, the public will know that everything has been done to, to prosecute them. Yeah. They can be prosecuted yeah. openly using criminal rules of evidence before one has to resort to the slightly more spooky end of things. Well, David, sorry. Well, just one, one question from me. I think this will be Thank for you, you Jonathan. Thank this you. Will be our final <laughs> no, no, no. For Jonathan. It's a very simple question. James, you said at the beginning, and I have some sympathy with this, that hostile state activity uh, is an existential threat in mm -hmm. the way that fortunately terrorism perhaps isn't. Yeah. It seems to be one very important difference between your jobs, and it's evident from your respective titles, or in your case, former title, is that you deal with the whole range of national security legislation whereas Jonathan can only deal with uh, counter-terrorism legislation. Yes. We have, of course, a bill before us at the moment, the National Security Bill, which would give us the opportunity with the right amendment to expand the role of the independent reviewer 
um, to review the whole range of uh, hostile state activity law, the whole range of national security law. And I just wonder, James, from your experience, uh, Jonathan, from your, uh, your sense of aspiration, uh, <laughs> do, do you think such an amendment would be a good idea? Uh, yes, Jonathan. <laughs> As you, as you well know, yes. <laughs> Good, well, we end on a note of agreement. Uh, yes. <laughs> I thought we were, for a terrible moment we were going to end with the offence of pillage, but no, we didn't. Um, thank you both very much uh, indeed for your uh, differing uh, perspectives. It seems to me that what we've learned is how, whatever the title and whatever the constitutional arrangements, uh, they have both, in their individual ways, manage to shape their roles to suit their own very considerable uh, strengths and talents. Thank you both very much indeed.